Yeah, I can see. Well, I can see now. I can see it. That's it. Perfect. Good. So, uh, I, as I said, I will talk about plasmid taxonomy, something we are developing right now, but already working, have been working on it for a few years right now. So, the idea here is if we aim to, if, if we want to understand plasmid function, plasmid uh, biology, we need the first thing we need is to make it clear what are the evolving units. In another words, what are, is the subject for evolution? So what, you know, and in, in the same way as we don't analyze one giraffe to know what's going on, but the species of giraffes, what should we do about plasmids? And in order to do that, we know already by some, uh, work that has been done before, that uh, for bacterial genomes, it has been found that uh, bacteria of the same species usually share, have a core genome as uh, Zam said before, which is um, maybe half of the genome or it depends. It depends, but uh, they are 95% identical. While individuals in different species are much less. So there is a value here of similarity, which makes the, um, say the definition of the species as the genomes which share a lot of DNA uh, quite impressive, no? as in this paper here. So uh, we did more or less the same for plasmids and, and the result was this paper that we published uh, last year, oh, well, now over a year ago. And in which, as you can see here, each node in this uh, graph is a plasmid, a plasmid sequence. And some plasmids are uh, related to each other. There is a, an edge between two nodes when there is a similarity over 70%, uh, over 80% of the, of the or 70% of the genome, or more than half of the genome. Uh, and so, so you see plasmids cluster, and we can analyze these clusters now. And that's what we did. Oh no, before that. Uh, okay, so uh, what we realize is that plasmids cluster in definite groups, and there is not much in between. Uh, so that this will be a similar representation to the representation of bacterial genomes. So in the same, by the same reason that we believe there are species because there are a bacteria or bacterial isolates which have, which have, which, uh, that have high similarities, the same happens for, for plasmids. And they cluster in these groups and we will analyze these clusters. So when we, analyze these clusters in, in detail, uh, of I cannot see, okay. Uh, we see that when we, here we look at the plasmids of the order Enterobacterales, which contains E. coli, Salmonella, and everything, as you see on top of the, this column here. Uh, and here you see that most, these are the PTUs of plasmid taxonomic units, and you can see that most of them, they appear in one or, or a few genera. So I, I was surprised to find that most plasmid taxonomic units are, they derive from one species or one genus of bacteria. Also, uh, so in some cases, they can appear in other uh, genera as well, but not in that many as we will see. So each PTU has its uh, a determined uh, host range. These are the genomes in which these plasmids have appeared uh, naturally, not the uh, bacteria to which we can transfer this plasmid. This is a different thing, and I will explain probably on, on Wednesday. But here you have all the PTUs in the, in the, this is the, the old data from the, our published paper. So we have here 
uh, 37 PTUs which are MOPLAS. That means that they are transmissible by conjugation. Uh, that contain most of the plasmids in enterobacterales, which are grouped in five classes. The classes are defined by the relaxase genes because this is like the slowest clock in a, in a plasmid. And, uh, and therefore there are five classes and each class we can distribute in several families which share the whole trout region. So in order to define the taxonomy of a plasmid, we will use the MOP type, which is the relaxase class. Then the family, which uh, somehow de defines the trust system and everything that is connected to that. And in, in many occasions are the partition genes and so on. And then the PTU, which contains a, a, a large backbone of that plasmid species. So what are the most important results in our paper? Uh, first, that most PTUs have a preferred host genus, as I said, and it, as it is shown in this figure. Uh, second, that the trust system is always conserved in or almost, well, always conserved with the exceptions that I will tell later in, a, in what we call a family. And then uh, one important uh, question or, or result is that the rep system is not conserved in, in many PTUs. And that is because uh, as, as we think now, the rep region can or has to change quickly when a plasmid moves from one bacterium to another. And therefore you can have, you have many PTUs uh, that have different uh, replication formulas. And this is shown here in a, in a close-up a zoom uh, to the uh, MOBF uh, class. The MOBF class has a subclass, which is F1, which are, are a number of plasmids that appear in enterobacterales because then there are others in cyanobacteria, actinomycetes, and so on, which contain also the MOBF class. But here, uh, we have three families. In F1, F11 family, uh, always the transfer system is a TI plasmid type transfer system with BB1, B2, B3, and so on. In MOBF12, is like a F plasmid, which contains like 25 or 30 genes involved in transfer. And, and each one has their own PTUs. Okay? So as you can see, this hierarchy of classes, families, and PTUs uh, tell us a lot about the properties of our plasma, the structural properties at least. Okay, so yeah, I will skip this one. So now we have updated our, dat uh, our database to a RepSec 200, which means we have analyzed over 19,000 plasmids. That's more than double that we used before. This is the uh, overall uh, picture of the network. Uh, and in this network, now we have 634 PTUs, which contain four or more members. That is almost uh, about 60% of the plasmids. And of them now, we have decided only to name those which have 10 or more plasmids, but still this is about half of the total. And that is because the very small PTUs, only four or five members, uh, we have found that uh, they are not so stable, let's say. And, and in the new classification, sometimes they get a, attached to another one and so on. So I will explain a little bit more about this. But so this is already a huge atlas, let's say, of the PTUs in, the, in all the bacterial kingdom. Oh, and here you have the names for everything that we, have, we find in the, in the enterobacterialis order. Here we have uh, seven over 7,000 plasmids. That, that means almost one third of all plasmids in NCBI 
be, uh, belong to these uh, two hosts in this order. And there are 226 PTUs more than four and 144 uh, name, which means uh, with 10 or more members. And here you have the names. We try to keep the ink C classification when possible for this, but sometimes we have like new names and so on. But here you have uh, all the complexity and uh, of this uh, cluster again. Uh, well, this is color by the mob uh, class. So you have members of five different classes in the enterobacterial sorter. And as uh, just to show one example, this is a, a PTU I1 a, a, that can be used an, as an example. Uh, the PTU contains 259 members. And here, this is a different network. This is an ACNET network. It's a, a, a network which is constructed by the relationship of plasmids with the different protein families. So each of, of the gray node is a protein family and each of the color node is a, is a plasmid. So as you can see, all plasmids within the uh, PTU I1 share a number of plasmid uh, protein families, which will be, so to say, the core of this uh, uh, PTU. And there, then there are many other uh, uh, pl uh, protein families which are present in a few or many of the plasmids, but no, but no all. When you see here the, the distribution of hosts, you see that Salmonella, E. coli, and Klebsiella and Shigella are more or less uh, distributed more or less randomly. So that's why we think. Uh, these I1 plasmids are able to uh, colonize, let's say, all the Enterobacteriaceae family. Here you have the same uh, network, but colored by the presence of the relaxase. As, uh, this is a, a P, P class relaxase, so it, it, it is blue. Uh, there are no others except when uh, this black is uh, two black dots that contain two mobs. And that's probably because they are co-integrates with somebody, something else. I, we are analyzing all this. And there are also a few which have no relaxes. As you can see, these three, four, five, six or so. We have found this in, in many PTUs that you have all plasmids uh, if, they con if the PTU, let's say, contains a relaxase, many plasmids contain that relaxase and no other. But some plasmids have lost it and they may have lost even the whole trial region. We have, uh, we have a, a paper published with Eduardo Rocha in, in, in bioarchives for the moment. And it shows the dynamics of the PTUs and it is shown there that PTUs are, as you can expect for plasmids, relatively unstable compared to the chromosome. So you get variants quite often. In these cases, they are still part of the PTU, but if the losses or gains are higher, they will get, get expelled from them. And okay. So, and then we have, for instance, if we look here, uh, we have drawn here everything which is related to the I1 PTU by at least one edge. And, and we can see that there we have connections with the C, E85, the BOK set, which is this part of the I1, which didn't contain the I pillows or something different, and E84. And, and as you can see, and I show this picture, just to show that there are plasmids which are left outside the PTU because of the rules, the strict rules we 
put to, to include a plasmid in a PTU, but uh, they are still connected with some of the of the plasmids in the PTU. And that's inter uh, maybe interesting in, in this outbreak analysis or so on, because you may have, you know, co-integrates, for instance, this uh, plasmid here seems to be a co-integrate of an I1 and a C plasma, okay? and so and so on. So there are many plasmids which lie outside the PTUs because they fail to comply with one of the rules. And this is good because that keeps the PTU well-defined. Mm -hmm. And, but you have, you may have one plasmid like this. And I will go to this at the end of my talk, which I, is not too far now. So uh, when we now look at the different PTUs, where they appear, what we find is that some PTUs like FS or FY, this is typical of Salmonella only, typical of Yersinia only, are a specific of a species. Some are specific of a given genus, some are specific to a family, and this is the majority. Uh, these are like 80 PTUs uh, here. Uh, up to the order, uh, another 30 or so, but very few PTUs can lie outside uh, an order, like a class or a film. Okay? Um, these ones are new here and we are still analyzing them. So what this means is that the rearm of a, of a PTU is the family if it's a conjugative element or maybe less if it's a non-transmissible, a no-mob element. As shown here, uh, uh, the host range of a uh, mob minus or no mob uh, PTUs are uh, narrower than the, the transmissible ones. And okay, I skip this. Just, just to finish, uh, you have here uh, in at this address uh, the complete network of, uh, of uh, plasmids in the database, and you can click on one like for instance, R100, if you search any plasmid which is in NCBI, you can find it here and all your, the connections of that plasmids can show. Here, in, because this is colored by the class, the F class is red. So many of these plasmids will be in the FE uh, cluster, but you can see everything, you know, you can uh, Click on each plasmid and see where it lies in the in the complete, and it gives you all the connections. So, uh, in order to classify your your plasmids, we uh, develop this um, tool called Copla, in which you can you uh, upload the sequence of your plasmid, and it gives you an output, which uh, the several files the PTU prediction that gives you the, the PTU, if, if it's assigned, the host range from one to six, as I explained before, the score, which is, if it's over 0.9, is very good, the size of the plasmid, and then the mob, which tells you the class, and the MPF, which tells you more or less the family of the plasmid, and also the replicon formula using a RepDB. Also, the antibiotic, the antimicrobial resistances that we find, and this is very important: the list of all connections of that plasmid, not only the ones which belong to the same PTU, but these others that I said that are in the periphery of the PTU, and therefore can help you in the analysis of your plasmid or the project in, in which you're involved. And I think that's all I wanted to say. Uh, this is my group here, and I would like to acknowledge main, mainly to uh, uh, Santiago Redondo, who uh, did a lot of, of almost all of the uh, bioinformatic development and of, of, of these, um, these tools. Then Mapi Garcillan, who did also a lot on the analysis, and Arancha uh, Peñil, who is also involved in the analysis of all of this. And I shouldn't forget Raul Fernandez, who helps me, help, helps me in, 
many things which are directly related or indirectly related to this project. And thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much, Fernando. Fantastic talk. Um, oh, it looks like we've got a hand up from James for a question. No, sorry, I, was, I thought there was a round of applause, sorry. <laughs> I, I don't know how to do Zoom. I don't know how to do Zoom. I don't know how to get rid of it. <laughs> okay, fine. I'm going to uh, a round of applause at least. And uh, if anyone has any questions, now's a good time. You have a few minutes before we start our next talk. But again, as you will have seen on the, on the schedule, there's, there's a chance. Uh, so there's a question from Olivia. Uh, sorry, Olivia Kostelitz, um, saying, what kind of data do you use to determine the host range of a plasmid? Sorry? What kind of data do you use to determine the host range of a plasmid? The only thing we do is to find out in what genera are the host of the plasmids in NCBI. So, for instance, for this I1 PTU, the PTU has 256 genomes. So we uh, we determine that, well, we determine the sequence uh, tells you the genome, the host uh, genera and the host species. And then we add the different species or the different genera. And uh, we grade that from one to six. If the all plasmids appear in one um, in one species is one, in one genus is two, in one family is three, in an order is four, in a class is five, and in a phylum is six. We have never found a plasmid which goes over, uh, that appears in different phyla. Uh, although we know, of course, that uh, plasmids can be delivered from one phylum to another. And we do that in the lab. Any follow up there, Olivia, or is that okay? You could still. So, sorry? No, it's okay. I was just checking. Uh, I was okay. just asking Olivia to tell us if that was a sufficient answer, but I think it is. Uh, anything from anyone else? Do we move on? Uh, sorry, we've got one from Liam Shaw, uh, who's speaking later this week, uh, as is Olivia. Um, uh, I'm just going to read it to you, um, read it out. Uh, thanks for a great talk, Fernando. I've read the papers associated, and I think they're fantastic too. I wanted to ask about intra-cluster density. Does host range mean that any member of a PTU works in any of its hosts? I don't know. The, the short answer is I don't know because I didn't check it. Uh, but I guess, I don't know. It's a good question because if plasmids within a PTU can have different replication formula, maybe they acquire a given replicon to be able to replicate in one host. So we can uh, see one plasmid in one host because it has acquired uh, just a replicon to make it able to replicate in that host and not changing uh, anything else or not very much. So I don't know, this, this should be checked for each PTU, but it's, it's a good question in the sense that now that we have defined what is a member of a PTU, what, what's the collection, you can analyze those as, as belonging to the PTU. And then you say if uh, each, each plasmid in the PTU can replicate in all of the uh, available hosts or not. But one thing is that you're able to replicate and another thing is that you appear there. Because uh, I don't know, uh, what, I, what we see is that uh, conjugation apparatus, apparatuses are in fact, most of them are very broad host range in W, in Ken, in P, and so on, in H, uh, in, in C, they appear to be able to send a plasmid almost everywhere. But that they send the plasmid there doesn't mean that the plasmid is able to be maintained there for a long time. It can replicate, but then there will be some 
say interactions with the host. And what, what we see is that the plasmids tend to appear mostly in one genus, in most of the cases. So that's kind of interesting. There's another question here. Maybe since there are like 20 minutes at the end of the, these talks, we can discuss more, no? Because it's kind of a time for the next talk. I, I don't mind to be answering questions. No, I, 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 let's move on. But um, the, the message from Teresa Koke is a comment rather than a question. So I'll just read it out. Uh, it seems you consider plasmids originated and evolved in different hosts, but databases are biased by clinical and very recent isolates, and it is probable they have another origin moved between bacterial species and selected in different species afterwards. So everything is biased by where we... Uh, yeah, that's, that that's a, a good species. theory, but I'm afraid it's not true, <laughs> at least uh, uh, by what I see, I saw. Hmm? Uh, yeah, we're, let's follow that up in the discussion section then, because that's okay. Fine. Okay, yeah, good. So, um, uh, Teresa, I hope that's okay. We will follow up that uh, at the discussion section, and then uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Victor Mateo Caceres, who's going to be talking to us about characterization of pipolins in firmicutes, shows a close evolutionary relationship between primary independent pol B's coding uh, or pol BS, I guess, coding elements and conjugative mobile genetic elements. Hi, are we 